Okay, uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for those of you uh, who don't know, my name is Darren Miller. I'm the Assembly Member for Cluid West and uh, in conjunction with members from other parties, uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to be here today for our inaugural meeting as a cross-party group uh, on monetary uh, reform. It's great to see so many people in attendance and it's good to see colleagues from other parties here, including Julie Morgan, uh, in, in, including the chair of the, of the Health Committee, who's obviously got a, a keen, keen interest uh, in this matter as well, Mark Drakeford, and my uh, good friend from North Wales, uh, Alan, Fred, uh, uh, Alan Fred. So I, I want to uh, give the opportunity to uh, receive a presentation from Positive Money uh, in a few uh, moments, just on the issue, the problem, uh, if you like, and to set a, 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 a sort of background scene as to why we need some monetary reform uh, here in the United Kingdom and what we might be able to do in Wales uh, as a consequence of the problems in our uh, banking system. Uh, well, it's great to welcome you all here. And for those of you who are visiting the National Assembly of Wales for the first time, I hope you'll be able to return uh, on other occasions as well and also take the opportunity to have a look around our magnificent Senev building uh, before you return to wherever you come from. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's great to have you here. We're going to start then with, uh, with Ben's uh, presentation, uh, just to give us a, a bit of background, and then we'll have some time for uh, discussion before all of the Assembly members have to disappear off for plenary this afternoon. Over to you, Ben. Okay. Can we just dim the lights at the back as well? Uh, what I'm going to do is just talk through um, some of the problems with the current monetary system, and hopefully this will start to shed a new light on the kind of uh, financial and government finance crisis that we have at the moment. Um, but before I do that, I just want to restate the common understanding of, of government, government finances. Oh, that's better. Um, so you have the public, and we get money from the public to fund government spending. Now, the problem in theory right now is that, well, the public don't have enough money, businesses aren't making enough money, and therefore there's not enough taxes to fund the current level of government spending. Now, that means that you have to borrow. And the reason borrowing is bad is because the higher the level of borrowing, the more you pay on interest and repayments, um, which gives you the pressure to now reduce government spending, as we, you know, we all know quite well. Um, the idea then is, rather than borrowing, we need to cut back the spending. Now, um, this whole idea of how the economy works and how government is financed assumes that there's a fixed amount of money in the economy and we have to get it from the public before you can use it for public services. Um, and I'm going to show that's not actually quite how it works. So, I'm going to go on to the question of where does money actually come from? And if you give this question a few seconds thought, it might seem obvious, because if you take out any five or ten pound note from your wallet, you'll see the words, the Bank of England, written on the side. Now, the twist in the story is that the Bank of England only creates a tiny percentage of all the money that exists in the economy. It's actually just 3%. So then the question we need to ask is, well, where does the other 97% of all the money come from? And the answer is that the vast majority of money in the economy, 97% of all the money that exists, is actually created by banks. And it's created by the, the same banks that we all know the name of, the same banks that were implicated in the financial crisis. Um, now, first time you hear this, it can be a little bit hard to believe. So I want to show you uh, some notable people who've talked about this. There's Mervyn King, the uh, top guy at the Bank of England, uh, a couple of weeks ago saying, when banks extend loans to their customers, they create money by crediting their customers' accounts. Um, so when you think that you're walking into a bank to take out a loan which is coming from somebody's life savings, that money isn't actually coming from anybody else's account or anybody's savings. It's actually just typed into, a, into an account. It's new money that is created. This is the um, chief economics commentator of the Financial Times, Martin Wolf. Uh, the essence of the contemporary monetary system is the creation of money out of nothing by private banks, often foolish lending. This is the Bank of England themselves in one of their reports. Uh, by far the largest role in creating broad money is played by the banking sector. When banks make loans, they create additional deposits for those that have borrowed the money. And then this is Jesse Norman, um, an MP, a Tory MP who's on the Treasury Select Committee. Uh, commercial banks have an even greater power than that. They have the power to create credit, that is money, by expanding their balance sheets. 
It is not widely understood how important this power is. Of the money presently in circulation in the UK economy today, 3% takes the form of cash, 97% is in credit and deposits. This, is, this financial alchemy is an extraordinary privilege which we as citizens and taxpayers underwrite. Um, so this, this fact that the money that we use is actually created by the banking sector rather than by the government isn't particularly well understood or particularly well known. Um, but it's, a, it's an issue that's becoming more widely discussed, as you'll just see from the, the quotes just there. So we have a situation where just 3% of all the money in the economy comes from the state through the Bank of England. And 97% is, is really just numbers in a computer system. And these numbers are created when banks make loans. Now, if this is the first time you've heard this, you're probably thinking, well, why didn't we know this before? Um, and there is uh, a, a book that we put together called Where Does Money Come From? We got a comment on the back from uh, Professor David Miles of the Monetary Policy Committee who just says the, uh, the way that monetary economics and banking is, t is taught in many, maybe most universities is very misleading. Um, and what is taught in universities is actually a model of the banking system that really was obsolete about 30 years ago. Um, but we still have staff in the Treasury and in um, policy-making roles who are following that model. Um, and this is dangerous because it's like allowing engineering students who don't understand gravity to build skyscrapers. We need to make sure that the people that are managing the economy understand money and where it comes from and how it's created. So how much money have the banks actually created? Well, this chart here, you see this green line at the bottom is the notes and coins, the cash that is created by the Bank of England. And then this mountain of money up here is the money that has been created by the banking system. And you can see that it took the first 300-odd um, years of the Bank of England's existence for the banking system to create the first trillion pounds, and then the next eight, year to, next eight years to create the second trillion. Um, now, I'm going to show you the consequences of this very shortly. Um, now, there's a question. If, if it's banks that are creating the money that is that makes up 97% of all money in the economy, then who is deciding how that money will be used? Is it the, uh, the local branch managers um, who make decisions over lending to businesses? Well, the reality is uh, these guys don't exist anymore. Um, this sort of local decision-making doesn't exist. What happens is the decisions are made at board level. And it's a broad decision over... Um, you know, you're on the board of one of these big banks, are we going to prioritise lending to business or are we going to focus on the investment banking and the speculation or are we going to put all our money into property? Um, and what this means essentially is that in the UK the five largest banks have the, about 85% of the market share um, and therefore they have the bulk of uh, the decision making over where this money goes. They have approximately well, they have about 78 board members between them. Probably only 20 of those are the key decision makers. And it's those 20 people who are deciding how the big banks create and allocate money across the economy. Um, in the five years running up to the financial crisis, they allocated £2.9 trillion. And actually, the entire uh, British government only, allocated, only spent £2.1 trillion in that time. So the banking sector actually has more spending power than the government. Okay. Um, and what that means is the money follows the priorities of um, the big banks. So we have right now just 8% of all bank lending goes to uh, productive businesses. So the, the businesses that contribute to the GDP figure um, that everybody is so focused on. Um, and that's, you know, this is the sort of job creation and the non-financial part of the economy. 92% um, goes towards non-GDP businesses, has price bubbles and financial speculation. Um, so this fairy tale that what banks do is they take money from savers and lend it to businesses is, is just that, it's a fairy tale. Right, so just to recap, key points. New money is created by the banking system every time somebody takes out a loan, a mortgage or an overdraft. And that has led us to the situation where the money supply has grown like this over the last 40 years. 
Okay, so the consequences. Well, the first consequence, um, uh, most people are familiar with the idea that if you just print money, you end up with inflation in the style of you know, Zimbabwe or Weimar Republic Germany. Um, now, again, Mervyn King, when loans are made, this creates new money. Um, and then he went on to say that the usual role of a central bank is to limit this rate of money creation so that excessive expansion of money spending does not lead to inflation. Now, this is how well they've managed to control that expansion in the money supply. There's been, um, since about 1970, the average growth rate of the amount of money in the economy has been 11.5%, um, much faster in the recent years as well. Um, but we have Mervyn King here saying, during the, the last uh, 20 years, annual consumer price inflation in this country has averaged 2.1%, remarkably close to the 2% target. So if the money supply has been growing at 11.5%, why are prices only going up at 2%? Well, the answer is that where the inflation happens depends on where the money goes. So in the 10 years running up to the start of the crisis, all the additional uh, new money that was created by the banking sector, um, this is how it was distributed across the economy. About 10% went to consumer finance, so credit cards, uh, personal loans. Um, things like this. 40% went to housing. Just 13% went to the non-financial businesses um, in the economy. That's the, the part of the economy that contributes to the GDP figures. And then 37% went into um, financial markets, financial intermediation, and essentially the financial sector. And you can see one of the results of that, if you look at the stock market, from the last few years, that curve pretty much follows the, um, the expansion of the money supply as well. Um, but the most obvious impact is on houses and house prices. Now this chart here, um, the purple line is house prices from relative to 1991. Um, so over the last 20 years, we've had a, a threefold increase in house prices. Now, you commonly hear that this is because there's too many people and not enough houses. You'll hear this argument in the press. Um, this green line down here is the population growth. So that over 20 years, the population grew by just 8%. Um, this red line, which is slightly above the green line, is the growth in the number of houses and flats and apartments in the, in the UK. And that grew by 16% in that time. So for every four new people, we built three new houses. Um, so supply and demand doesn't really explain why house prices have gone up. The only thing that really does is this line at the top, which is mortgage lending. And if you remember from what we've just seen earlier, every new mortgage creates an equivalent amount of new money. So this is really money creation, and most of that money has gone into property, and that's what put, has pushed up property prices. Okay. Now the impact of that is if you add in the interest, um, if you'd have bought a house in 1952, it would have cost you about five years and three months of your salary to pay off everything. Um, nowadays, you, if you buy a house uh, last year, you would be looking at spending 11 years and eight months of your salary just to pay off the mortgage. Okay, so then let's go on to the impact on jobs and businesses. Well, we have what, what economists call the real economy, which is the non-financial sector, essentially. And we have the banking sector. And it's the banking sector that creates the money um, that the real economy has to use in order to be able to, to do business and to trade. There has to be interest paid on all of this money um, because, because it has to be borrowed. And what that means is that almost every pound circulating through the banking system, every pound in your bank account, is matched by a pound of debt owed by somewhere else. And we're effectively paying interest on the entire money supply. Um, so that's a big redistribution of income from the real economy uh, to the financial sector. And this also works geographically because, again, the, the big banks are sort of centred in London. Um, the rest of the economy needs money in order to function. And they, you know, even if it's just circulating within Wales, for example, that money still has to be created by a bank in the first place. And again, interest has to be paid on all the money that exists. 
So um, that is a big redistribution back to the center. Um, in terms of how it affects businesses, now a lot of people would think that consumer finance is good because it means more spending, more money coming through uh, your shop till. Now the reality is that what happens is people, you know, they borrow, they spend on credit cards, they use personal loans, but all of this money is being spent on credit and eventually you get the bill. And people think, well, I've, I've borrowed too much, I'm going to stop spending now. So they stop spending, the economy starts to go down. Now in this time, businesses here were investing and expanding, taking on more staff. Um, most businesses are not really aware of how the monetary system works, so they assume that the economy is doing really well. They just see more money coming through the tills and they think, well, we'll expand, we'll open new branches, we'll take on um, debt in order to expand the business even faster. And then in this point, they're laying off and trying to survive. Now, it would be better, rather than having this, um, you know, the, the feast and famine that we have with, uh, you know, all the credit cards and all this creation of money, it would be better for most businesses to have steady spending year on year so that they can grow without having... Uh, this instability. Now when you have the recession that inevitably happens because there's too much debt in the economy, um, it tends to be the low paid and the temporary contract workers who get laid off first because they have the least secure contracts. So this has a real impact for, for the poor and for people on uh, low paid jobs. Now this is Adair Turner who's the chairman of the Financial Services Authority. Um, for about two years, we've been arguing um, that it's the monetary system that caused the crisis. Uh, about 10 days ago, he came out and said the financial crisis of 2007 to 2008 occurred because we failed to constrain the private financial system's creation of private credit and money. Um, and this is exactly what we've been arguing. Okay. Now, it has a big impact on debt as well. Um, and again, because all the money that we use has to be borrowed from the banks. And uh, you, have to re you, know, you have to make the repayments plus the interest. And we've calculated, well, actually, from Bank of England figures, that interest on all the existing debt is um, well, it's 108 billion to 217 billion a year, depending on where the interest rates are at the time. Um, and again, this is a huge transfer from the public to the banking system. Some of it comes back to savers in, in the way of interest on your savings. But much of it is just siphoned off in the middle and it goes through to the, you know, the huge bonuses and the big uh, salaries. Now, having a, a monetary system that works this way means that the, the economy doesn't function quite as most people would assume it does. Um, the first rule of how the economy actually functions is that if we need more money in the economy, then we have to take on more debt because banks are effectively the only source of additional money coming into the economy. They create it when people go into debt, when people take out loans, as, um, sorry, as Mervyn King has said here. Now, if we have a crisis that is caused by people having too much debt, and then we want people to start paying down that debt, well, the problem is, um, as Mervyn King says, uh, a damaged banking system means that today banks aren't creating enough money, uh, they're not lending enough, and people are repaying existing debts. Now, the problem when people repay existing debts um, is that, he says here, as private sector balance sheets contract, public sector, um, that's the government and central bank, balance sheets have to take the strain. What he's referring to is the fact that when you repay your loans, um, the reverse process happens to when you take out a loan. So you take out a loan and new money is created. When you repay a loan, that money disappears from the system. Um, and what is happening post-crisis is that people are trying to repay this debt. Now, what this means is that we would have less money in the economy. If people are successful in paying down their debts, then the money supply shrinks. And if the money supply shrinks, it's like taking the oil out of the engine of a car. You know, eventually, everything grinds to a halt. Um, what we need right now is we need less debt and we need more money in the economy. Um, but that is practically impossible with the current monetary system until we reform that system. Okay, now, okay so I just want to move on to um, what positive money you're arguing for. Um, that's a very brief overview of some of the problems that this system causes. Um, what we would like to see is that we remove the power of banks to create money. And um, the reason for that is because 
Firstly, if you give the power to create money to banks, they're always going to create too much because of the incentives and the bonuses and the, the drive to maximize your profit by lending as much as possible. Um, and Adair Turner has sort of stated this quite clearly just a couple of weeks ago. Um, the existence of banks as we know them today, fractional reserve banks, exacerbates these risks because banks can create credit and private money and unless controlled will tend to create suboptimally large or suboptimally uh, unstable quantities of both credit and private money. The impact of fractional reserve banks, that's the, the monetary system we have today, is thus to make the financial system and the overall economy inherently more invulnerable to instability. Um, so they always create too much and this causes instability in the economy. They also create it for the, for the wrong things. We have um, huge quantities of money pushing up house prices, which makes it more expensive for people to live. Uh, we have huge quantities of money blowing up the financial markets, and yet we have um, relatively little money going into the real businesses that actually create jobs and actually provide the salaries that will allow people to pay these inflated house prices. And again, as, as um, Adair Turner has said, the financial crisis was caused by this ability of the banking system to expand the money supply. Um, so we want to return the power to create money to the state. Now, this is often seen as quite radical, but it's actually been done before in the past. In the 1840s, banks would, um, when you put your metal coins into a bank, they would give you a piece of paper in return, and that would be a receipt. And it would say you've deposited five pounds. Now, people started to use these receipts in place of the money, because it was easier to carry paper around than it was to carry those coins around. Um, as these pieces of paper became used as money, then banks realized that if they printed more of them, people would accept them, they'd borrow them and pay interest on top, um, and that, that would uh, allow them to maximize their profits. Now, with those incentives, they ended up creating too much, uh, too much paper money. So in 1844, a uh, conservative prime minister, Robert Peel, stepped in and said, well, this, this needs to be stopped. Uh, we can't have all these private banks just creating money um, when they feel like it. And they passed the law that now makes it illegal for you or I to print our own money. Now, ever since then, um, the profit on creating paper money, which is the difference between the cost of printing uh, a £10 note and the actual £10 value of it, goes to the Treasury and it reduces how much taxes have to be paid. Um, and this has been a, a significant amount of money, probably about £18 billion over the last 10 years. Um, which is, you know, enough to pay the salaries of about 120,000 nurses. It's, uh, it's significant. But the problem is that this law has never been updated since 1844. So it still only applies to banknotes, even though banknotes now are just 3% of all the money in the economy. And 97% of all the money is uh, numbers in computer systems, which are created by banks. Now, what this has meant is that um, the government as a whole has lost about 2.1 trillion in uh, government revenue today from allowing the banking sector to create money in place of the state. And you can see that here. This is what the profit that we've made on creating cash. And this is the uh, profit that has been lost by allowing the banking sector to have this role. The question always is, if you give the state the power to create money, it will be inflationary. Well, I think the response to that is, well, really, is this not inflationary, allowing banks to have this power to create money and giving them the incentives that will drive them to create too much? Um, but of course, you do need to protect it from political abuse. So you don't necessarily want to give that power to the chancellor. Um, you want to make it, give it to an independent body and just say simply, if uh, inflation goes up, then you need to stop creating money. And then what we need to do is use that money that is created in the public interest. And there are a number of options um, that you can use to get this money into the economy. The first obvious two are that you either spend more on public services or you use that money to cover your existing spending and you cut taxes instead. Um, and you could do this decentralised. So if they're going to create um, £50 billion, pounds, then you could distribute that per capita and make sure you know, the Welsh Assembly can distribute 
its proportion, and the same with Scotland and across the uh, across the UK. Um, you could use it to pay down the national debt. There's a number of reasons that that wouldn't be a high priority, which I haven't got time to go into. But um, the other option is that you could just give it directly to people. So, for example, with the quantitative easing, um, the £375 billion that has been created and put into financial markets, if that was divided up between people, you would have had, um, your recession would have been over. Uh, people would have been able to pay down their debts and you would have had a real stimulus on the high street and in real businesses. Um, so I just want to give you, to wrap up, one uh, example of how absurd the situation has become. Uh, and it's something that really, really winds me up. The uh, school's rebuilding program. Um, now, for the, uh, the English uh, school rebuilding program, they've just announced about £2 billion for work to be carried out over five years. Uh, about 600 schools applied to this scheme. 219 were accepted. They're using a private finance initiative to, to meet the cost of this. So they're borrowing money from the private sector, from, probably from banks, which will be created out of nothing by the banking system because the government hasn't got enough money of itself. Um, and the reason they're doing this is because you know, it allows them not to record it as part of the capital budget, which has been reduced to 3.8 billion. Um, now, in Wales, in particular, this is the, um, the schedule for Wales for the, uh, the rebuilding here. Um, a total of 1.36 billion to be spent on rebuilding schools up to 2015. A total of 4.43 billion to do the full rebuilding job over about 15 years. So the, this is, sorry, um, mortgages, this green line at the top. Um, in 1999, in one month, the banking sector created £4.5 billion pounds of new money to fund mortgages and consumer finance. In July 2005, they created £7 billion pounds of new money to keep expanding this lending. In September 2007, they created £16 billion pounds of new money. So the entire 15-year school rebuilding project for Wales is equivalent to one week's worth of money creation in 2007 by the banking sector. And yet we've given the banks this power to create money. We've, economists have convinced themselves that the state can't handle that power responsibly. And instead of putting, say, the QE money into something useful, it's gone straight back into the financial markets. And then you can see, so actually this, this 375 million, uh, billion pounds is enough to employ three and a half million people on 20,000 pounds a year for five years, and yet we have three million people sat at home across the, across the nation, want, you know, desperately looking for something to do. Um, so yeah, just, just, this is just one example of how absurd this system is of allowing the banking system to create money in place of the state. Um, in terms of how we repair this, uh, we've spent a lot of time thinking this through. We're releasing a book in January, which is about 300 pages of detail of how actually you can fix this system and take that power to create money back to the state. Um, so I'll wrap up there so we've got time for questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Can we just flick the lights on at the back? Thank you.